There are finite games and there are infinite games. Finite games are played to be brought to an end. And the winner is often given a title and there's prestige and things like that. Infinite games are played so that play will continue. Almost everything that we do in our culture, we are unconsciously playing finite games as finite players. The thing that he hints at, the last thing he says is, there is only one infinite game. The infinite game is the infinite game of life. It's that there is and that whatever is seems to be playing with itself in a way that continues the game. There are not two infinite players. There's one infinite player playing the infinite game. From this model, that's as close as you can linguistically get to the thing. Welcome back to the transmission, my friends, and happy fresh solar cycle to you. Uh, as cliche as that sentiment has become, I really do think these big natural cycle shifts are worth acknowledging because they really are uh, fantastic opportunities to remind yourself, oh yeah, I really am an impermanent little noodle of sentience in the broth of samsara. I am, or at least my avatar is, a decaying little critter on the game board of life. And am I playing said game the way my highest will wants to be playing it? Am I building the skill tree? Am I having the experiences? Am I grinding on the correct quests? Is my compass aligned the way I want it to be on this adventure? And if not, how do I correct it? But I shan't continue uh, waxing about that metaphor because we will quickly start tallying up minutes. And to be honest with you, there's no one I'd rather shed minutes with than my wonder brother, Eric Godsey, experienced wonder dippers will know. He is one of the most popular, most frequent guests in the mind meld. He's a writer, he's a podcaster, he hosts a show called The Myths That Make Us, and he's one of the finest musers I know, particularly on the topics of psychology, science, philosophy, the esoteric, all of my very favorite fair. And this one in particular is indeed marinated in all of the above, though the central spice is the idea of life as a game. And I mean that in the most meta-mystical possible sense. Like in the sense that Jung said in Memories, Dreams, Reflections, time is a child playing and we live in the kingdom of that child. And with that incorrect quote, uh, tickle that algorithm with a like, a sub, a comment, a share. It is of the utmost importance. Another thing I know you hear over and over, but it really is important. It is the only currency in the YouTube dimension. All the links you're gonna need for Eric Godsey are in the description. Same for third eye drops. This mind meld is actually from our back catalog. Until now, it was only available in audio form. You will find this one and numerous more with Godzi and hundreds of other brilliant beings wherever you listen to podcasts. Most of those will never go up here on YouTube. So do sub on Apple Pods, Spotify, wherever you listen. And if you would like to go deeper, if you'd like to join an exclusive community with over 200 other Wonder Dippers, participate in Zoom hangs, a patron-only Discord server, a book club, get rewards like stickers, pins, shirts, and more, join us at patreon.com forward slash third eye drops. And with that, my friends, let's initiate this mind meld with my Wonder Brother and yours, Eric Godsey. There's always some kind of joke or reference to the pre-talk, but I can honestly say that this is the most um, temporally epic pre-talk, chronologically epic pre-talk <laughs> I think I've ever had because we have genuinely been talking for over an hour already. And uh, it, it almost makes it like, what what haven't we talked about? But <laughs> little little, I was gonna say little does everyone know, but they probably do know. You and I literally can just talk until we fall asleep. Yeah. Like when last time we hung out, I showed up at your place probably at like seven or something. Mm -hmm. And then it was like midnight and you're like, I got to go to bed. <laughs> like, and that's just like, that's just, that's how the whole, the whole thing went. Yeah. 
Yeah. Uh, the moment that we added cannabis to it, that's when time just, you know, blooped. Indeed it did. Indeed it did boop. But one of the things that we talked around that I do really want to hear the full shape of your thoughts on is this idea of living in interconnected hierarchical games. And I know this is something you're working on and it's sort of a weird thing. Maybe it's not a synchronicity because I think maybe this is one of the most logical ways to reduce reality down into is that it is this series of games and the synchronicity part comes in because in the now lost book that I wrote, there was a whole chapter on games and there was a whole chapter on instead of like, I think most people, when they hear the idea of a game, there's an inherent trivialization. Like it's fun. It's silly. Mm -hmm. But when you really zoom out on things, anything worth anything could Mm -hmm. be conceived of as a game you know like you could conceive of um evolution and adaptation as a game because it's it's organisms seeking payoffs you could conceive of um the most profound story or mythological paradigm as a kind of game you know there's always two not always but usually there's two opposing dualistic forces vying for something right and the example that I use actually is the, um, are you familiar with the not, the Nataraja image, the dancing Shiva? Yeah. So the, the dancing Shiva image has all of these, you know, we were talking about signs versus symbols mm-hmm. before as well. And this is like an amazing symbol in that it's depicting so much in one piece. And that's exactly like what a symbol does. Right. Exactly. Right. And when you realize that even what that image of this dancing almighty deity that's beating the drum of space and time and stomping on the demonic manifestation of ignorance and its dance is like, you know, depicting the drama of the cosmos and all of these things. What is he doing? He's playing. Mm -hmm. He's playing a fucking game. Mm -hmm. He's dancing, you know? Yeah. So it is really interesting to reframe this whole concept of games mm-hmm. in in a, in almost a cosmic significance but also a deeply personal one too like it, it really extends all the way out from the micro to the macro 100% and it's one of it's one of the ideas that once you try to get your hands on it you realize that you can't fit your arms around it and that you also can't ever actually set it down. And what I mean by that is um, one of my favorite things to do when I was a kid was as soon as I found games, I love to play games. Uh, There's psychologists that will watch children. And once they reach a certain age, they will spontaneously, almost as if it's an innate instinct, start to play games. What's really interesting is that I believe it's like age two to three, they can agree, they can play games out, which means that they are following some type of pattern with someone else or with an object or whatever. But then if you ask them after the play what the rules were, they can't tell you. And then once they get to about age four or five, if it's a simple game, they can start to tell you. And as they get older, the coherency and the precision of their articulation of the patterns they were doing get better and better. So it seems to be an innate drive. We also can't seem but to help to create things in the same patterns that our brain works. And so mm-hmm. early in our, in our cultural history, we started to develop games. And Go and chess, you know, are two of the oldest board games ever created. And there is something about those games to the degree that they're popular with millions of people over thousands of years that indicate that it's mapping onto something about the structure of how our Ooh. perceptual systems interact with reality. Mm-hmm. Like there's some type mm-hmm. of overlap. And then you scale that up to video games. 
And then yeah. you scale that up to VR and then you scale that up to the thing that makes social media so addic- addictive is the quote unquote gamification. One of the things that we've learned with the last 100 years is that the way our nervous system grows, the way our nervous system evolved to interact with objective reality, one of the best ways to describe the pattern of that type of interaction is through a game. Yeah. And the game is essentially our nervous system has this like meaty, flexible thing. And it has this inner sense of like, if I try to fling this over here and I'm an infant, it's all weird, but I'm constantly getting feedback from my attempts. I'm trying and I'm failing and I'm generating, and this is all instinctive. They're generating a a map of reality. And to the degree that the map of reality maps onto the feedback you get from reality. So like if you think that the table ends here, but it doesn't and you crawl over it and you fall and you smash your head on the floor, feedback that the map wasn't mapping. Our neurotransmitters seem to respond when our inner map corresponds with the outer map. And that would be like you did something right in the game of life and you got back Mm -hmm. gold or experience points or whatever. Those are metaphors for how our nervous system seems to function. And that games like specifically play with mammals is one of the best things that a parent can do for the infant to help it basically like to help the nervous system seep into the limbs and to really start to bring coherence. And so one of the, one of our modern understandings of neurobiology in the last 50 years is that one of our core requirements as if you think of a nervous system as like a plant, one of our core requirements is touch slash physical play, like the play of my body against your body. And so there's that whole realm over here. And then there's one of the most impactful books I read in college is called The Games People Play. And it was written Mm -hmm. in the fifties by a psychologist named Eric Bernay. And he created this type of psychology called transactional psychology And this book was a New York Times bestseller back in the 50s. And it was one of the first like psychoanalytic books that kind of came on in the US that was written for the layman that became a New York Times bestseller. And basically what he did in that is he broke down conversations and he broke down how conversations are games. And a uh, quick, broad brushstroke is that in his model, people are afraid of intimacy. It terrifies us. And so in order to avoid intimacy, we create what he calls pastimes. Pastimes are games. And there's all, there's all sorts of games that people will play while they're in the same space with each other to protect them from intimacy. Interesting. And like, you know, there's the small talk that you have at a work event. There's actually playing checkers or whatever the thing is. But where he zoomed in and what made his book famous is he looked at how the family will play games with each other to avoid the painful things that have happened in the family. And he created this model where you have your inner parent, your inner adult, and your inner child. And every conversation, each of those three are trying to say something to the other person's parent, adult, Mm. and child. It's almost like internal family systems. Exactly. Like this was a precursor to internal family systems. And so the parent is basically your inner representation of how things should be. Your inner adult would be what internal family systems would call the self. It's the unwounded, untraumatized, loving awareness. And then the child is the wounded part. You know, it's the young part. It doesn't have to be wounded, but we all have childhood wounds. I'm sorry, that's uncomfortable for you to feel into. But the thing that he broke down is he gave like layman names that immediately revealed the truth that we do play these games. And one that I remember is like, I've got you now, you son of a bitch. That was one of Mm. the famous ones. And that game is where I'm the mother, you're the child. I know you broke the vase. I'm not doing this on purpose, but I come up to you and I ask you, 
did you break a vase today? And because I'm a child and I know that you're going to hit me or whatever, I lie. And then I use you lying to justify me being even more aggressive towards you. Yeah. Like, and you can see why this book was so famous was he -hmm. presented it all in the beginning as this, like, we play games. And then, but then he gets into the fucking muck of human life, but gives the model of the game. And there's something like jarringly attractive about, oh, this is a person who can see some type of truth, can see it deeply enough to where he can see how like almost like it's uranium to consciousness. Hmm. But then he puts it inside of the metaphor of play. And it almost like allows humans, like it allows the everyday human to look at parts of the human experience that are so filled with grief and pain and shame and fear that most of us spend our whole lives trying to look away from that part of life. Yeah. But because it's put through the frame of a game, it almost like it allows us to stomach for even a moment that like, oh yeah, I remember when I was five and I had that experience with my older brother or I had that experience with my best friend or with my mother or whatever the thing is. And I remember how much shame and pain I felt. And I'm connecting now for the first time to, oh, here's how much of my life that was a game I was playing out so I wouldn't feel that thing again. Like that's the thing that's really disturbing, but also enlightening about psychoanalytic, Mm -hmm. like Mm -hmm. self-reflection is don't pathologize yourself but also if you're someone who's genuinely interested in the patterns of reality one of the most interesting places to look at is if if you imagine that life is a game and that you're a player in the game of life if you were going to study some players like skill set you would watch all their games and you would start to get a sense of like this is where they like to get on the court this is what they like to do when they get there This is what happens if you talk shit to them. You know, it's like a scouting report. Like one of the things that's so honest about sports is it's like, I don't give a fuck what you say you're doing. I get to look at what you did. And I can look over the course of five years, you know, 500 games and extract out your patterns. And it's like, it's honest. So Mm -hmm. I've been trying to. But But yet that's also not the whole story either. I mean, you can look at somebody's whole statistical uh, history and there's always a moment to break that, right? Yeah. There's always a moment for them to play better, play worse, suddenly get better at free throws. Like that that's one of the interesting 100%. things where it's like it's open-ended. Like all of this is open-ended. Yeah, and the thing that feels important for people to know if they want to try to change their life is there's a... One of our core fears is to look away from that which when we look at it, it makes us feel fear. Like, And I think people will allow that fear to stay in their repertoire of plays that they play in the game of life by like spiritually bypassing. Oh, yeah. And it's like if what we know from both like – uh, f- like folklore wisdom of people talking about what makes great people and what we've also learned directly in, you know, a hundred years of studying this field of psychology is that if you measure whatever it is about you, whatever behavior it is about you that you would like to change, just the act of honestly measuring it every day what they find is that you start to unconsciously improve in the direction that you want to go. So if it's weight or if it's how long you walk or how many um, times you take tobacco throughout the day, whatever, just tracking has such a strong effect that researchers have to create experiments to exclude it, almost like it's the placebo effect. Um, in order to test other parts of what helps people change because it has such a strong effect size. And that, so if you're playing the game of life, 
and you're doing the psychoanalytic kind of like autobiographical review, your patterns should not indicate to you that this is how you, it's not a fact of your stagnancy. It is a probability of what your next choice would be if you weren't conscious. And this is an Great interesting point. thing Great that I've point. been playing with and I haven't really had a chance to talk with it with people. And so I'd love to introduce it here. And, and it fits into yeah. this whole game of life thing. And it's that there's a lot of people who, um, like if you study even a little bit of psychology, you start to realize that people who think that we have quote unquote absolute free will, like you're fucking hilarious. And then there's people on the other spectrum and it's basically like Sam Harris and people who have learned to copy his argument because I, mm -hmm. it doesn't feel like I've met anyone who lives as if this isn't the case, but there are people who believe that there's no free will. A really interesting thing that uh, came up for me as I was watching the How to Change Your Mind documentary series on Netflix made by Michael Pollan, um, the episode where they talk about, I believe it's LSD, it might have been mushrooms, but I think it was LSD, is that there was a patient who had OCD since he was a child, and he did, I believe it was LSD. I think it, I think this is the mushrooms episode. All right, cool. Then I could be he, wrong, but I think it is the psilocybin. Cool. And he does whatever psychedelic, and he has the experience of uh, becoming a tree. Mm -hmm. And he's he feels what it feels like to be a tree that grows and stays in the same place, but is always transforming. And then as the tree, he sees his family. Yeah. And like he brings down his branch to almost like give a leaf to the father who he is like, he's like in real life, he's the dad. And then the leaf is given to the child and the child plays with the leaf. And he just felt the, like the reciprocal dynamic interconnectedness of the family and the tree. After he had that experience, the following couple of weeks, he didn't even feel his OCD urges. And so yeah. he was like, this is incredible. But then after a couple of weeks, he started to feel the urge. And he said that once he felt the urge for the first time in his life, he, he could feel that he had the space to choose not to. Yeah. Whereas his, see, like, yeah, this is absurd. Like, why would I do this? Yeah. His entire life before the experience with the psychedelic, he would feel it. He would feel his inability to have any room to choose and then he would feel the self anger and shame and hatred as he did the thing that he knew was stupid. Like he knew it was absurd before, but he, he didn't feel that he had nothing on his like game pad that would allow him to press a button to choose otherwise. Right. Right. And so one of the ideas that I'm playing with is like the brain has to develop to a point where it can begin to run episodic memory and language. And that is kind of the birth of the quote unquote ego. And that's like age three. My intuition is that I don't know how you would measure it, but that there's a type of psychological and physiological development that has to reach a certain point. And then there has to be like a, a catalyzing event, but it then sparks the aperture for choice to happen. And it's a really small aperture. And the way that I think about that metaphorically is it's like you start the game of life, not even as a player on some interesting philosophical level. And then the player is born around age three. And it's that, and I, you know, it can get much more interesting and deep than that. But then that first version of the player is an NPC. In some sense, it's a non-playable character. Like you're witnessing the desires and the instincts and the unfolding of this thing. And then at some point you get the opportunity to start being a role-playing character, mm -hmm. but you don't yet have the level of meta awareness where you get to choose what roles you play. Yeah. Like yeah. most of us, our first life is we are just playing the role that kind of like was the quote unquote roll of the dice, you know, we're, we're downloading a huge file. Or like downloading the, the file of how to human for the first like right and eight, it's almost always years. some version of the parts of my parents i liked or the parts of my parents that i know if i become i get to break away from them 
and then what fits into culture and that what feels good with my intrinsic desires and genes. And, you know, it's like for most people, it's a single identity that they think is the best way to be. They have a very small worldview. Um, and I could just go on and on and on. But the idea yeah. I wanted to introduce was this idea of maybe the beginning of choice is actually not something that all people have access to and that there might be a way to cultivate it. There might be a way to measure it and observe it. Um, but I guess the idea that I'm playing with is that my conception of free will is like, if you imagine like a wheel and that's, it's a percentage wheel, like my wheel of free will feels like I got like 1% and then I got 99% other shit. But that 1% is almost like it can rewrite the code that can go back into the deep learning that right, then right, will right, proliferate right. in a way that can totally change the direction of my life. Um, you know, and I feel like I have to work hard to keep that aperture of that 1% open. Yeah. But I don't feel that I always had it. It feels like something in my hap in my life happened where it's like it opened up that aperture. But before that, yeah. Like I think up until I was like 19, I don't know if I ever had the aperture open. Right. I have a lot to say about this. <laughs> a lot to say. Before I forget, though, I, I had a smile on my face toward the beginning of when we, you were talking because you were talking about chess and Go being two of the oldest games. And let's do a little hermetic as above, so below exercise quick. When you're coming up on mushrooms or something or another trip to mean, one of the most common visuals people get is what they call the grid mm. this this waving grid like pattern like this is something i reliably see up in the sky Same. i see what wow. looks like a waving grid of just like whoosh, whoosh, interconnectedness and then Whoa. on really really strong experiences i start to see that interconnected geometry like flowing in and out of everything and then it really feels like you're peering into the work of the demiurge like you're seeing the fucking like fibers of the game that is so interesting um yeah, I've, but then too i, made that I mean wow. let's let's think about too on an even more meta hmm. level than that how is space time depicted like exactly. space time is depicted as a fucking grid exactly you know so it's like you just can't escape the grid man the grid is everywhere the grid is just like capturing our minds our games our right. systems and our ways thing of that, mapping yeah the thing that's interesting is it's like i think we are getting to a level of like like self-reflective consciousness where yeah. we're yeah. starting to be able to appreciate the fundamental patterns of how our genes evolved through time to develop the incomprehensible elegance of the biology that makes up our nervous system to solve the problem for like we are genes who create bodies that have to compete with other gene families that share the planet with us. And there seems to be some absolute reality that exerts a type of consistent pressure that we mm -hmm. can articulate as the laws of physics mm -hmm. that seem to come together in a very stable way when they interact with genes who make bodies as what we understand yeah. as space time. And that, something about how we evolved and like the fucking hardware that's coming through our eyeballs. Cause your eyeballs are literally your brain. Like it's, yep, it's an extension yep. of your brain. That's just fucking, right. there's a hole in your skull and your brain is poking out into mm -hmm, actual mm -hmm. out here. It's, yep. it's fucking wild, but something about the technology of the eye has inherent with it in it, this grid. And the idea would be like, 
my very remedial understanding of math is that um the i'm gonna have to get a pen out eric <laughs> there's so many things there's so many things keep going that the grid and the square so that there are like um platonic shapes like oh here we go absolutely here we go fundamental shapes that seem to be like the fundamental structure that from which all the shit gets made and that the grid you know is a bunch of squares in two dimensional space i guess there are grids that could be three dimensional and if you if if you oh, yeah. place enough two dimensional grids on each other, you fucking get a cube, and so of course it can be, and that might right. be yep. what it is that we're experiencing. Well, yeah, and think about what a video game is. It's just wire. It's cu- it's wire framed grids. Now, the interesting idea I've been playing with just the last few days is I think it feels as if the type of grid that our nervous system creates is a spherical grid not a cubed grid. And I think that you can test that as easily as walking outside and like really allowing your eyes to relax and starting to recognize that like, especially once you start to appreciate how your ears quote unquote can see, you can really start to get a sense of like what's behind you. And so it actually feels like, I think if we're really going to try to bore down into it, like, it's so hard to try to represent this to myself, but it's almost like a really wide lens camera type, like almost uh, like weird futuristic looking curved couch out front, like where the eyes go out. But then you have an entire sense of an inner world inside of you that in some way encapsulates the entire space time view that you have and it's almost like i guess a way to think about it is if you took a vr room and you put that inside of a building the whole building is this is the nervous system but then the room with the vr helmet is our eyeballs experiencing with our ears and shit the little sliver of space time that we can see and i've been Yakadin and yakadin. So I'm going to pass over back. So to you I can keep going uh, there, there was some, there were some points on the previous, um, on your whole previous, and now we're totally just derailing this whole interesting, no, it's fine. this whole it's interesting jazz, line of conversation. But you were talking about how that whole type of psychology, that transactional psychology revolves around this central notion of avoiding intimacy. Hmm. And I would probably have to read his definition of intimacy, but I don't personally like that word as much because I feel like I'm someone who goes toward intimacy innately. So for me, maybe it's like, because I'm more of a, um, like I, I score highly, for example, on like in intuitiveness and, um, I think because I'm somebody who has a, a high amount of that trait in that I I sense a feeling and I go toward that feeling, I actually want to get to the root of what those things are. And I think what he's saying maps really interesting onto, first of all, it seems like there's this temptation in psychology to try to find one central point of orbit 100 you know, like and you can Fre- guarantee Freud, if someone's Freud. doing that without humor that they're yeah they got stuck somewhere like freud did this with sex mm-hmm. and then of course young couldn't accept that everything was boiled down to that which eventually caused that whole schism that they had but then what it, this is what it reminded me of that young said young basically said that if you can if you can show me uh, what was the quote it was basically something like if you can show me what that person's avoiding, I can show you the wound. Hmm. Like I can show you the, how to heal it. But essentially like the whole, his whole psychotherapeutic model was to get people comfortable and talking around the wound until they were comfortable enough to confront it and deal with it and process it or, or whatever. And I think that the um, real thing to watch out for is if you're talking to someone who's, you know, in that role as like a psychotherapist or a helper, 
and they think they know what the wound is and they're trying to guide you there, that's not the way. Yeah. Because I think that like there was a huge problem in the United States for like 20 years about um, kind of like late stage neo Freudianism that just the way it was playing out now that it was like a hundred years away from the creator himself is there were a lot of people who either consciously or unconsciously as a therapist were interacting with the clients in a way that would lead them towards away from their subjective experience and towards the expectation of what the therapist thought. And it's, Hmm. yeah, it's not the sauce, but sorry, go on. Yeah. And, and I think maybe another thing that again is another feather in the cap of young is you can make anything map back to a single point. If you identify an archetype, because the archetypes run through the way that we centrally think about everything and they have their their claws or whatever appendage you want to use right. depending on the archetype in everything right so we could say no everything revolves around power everything revolves around sex everything revolves around a game everything revolves around you know wanting to uh, well, I already said control. I guess that's sort of the same saying like it, controlling or something like that. Everything's so an illusion. Obvious... Everyone's out to get me. Right. Everyone is secretly conspiring to help me become the God King of, you know, Pope land or whatever. Yeah. So, I, so I, this is why I return to being interested in the paradigm of games, because I think you, that I don't think you can get more meta than that except for the idea of a duality transcending so check this out that's that's outside the game that's outside the game yeah so the re the thing i've noticed that i've been tracking games my whole life i've thought that they were interesting and then i read finite and infinite games by james cars have you read this yeah that's been on my list <sighs> we've talked about it before <sighs> i haven't read it i haven't you're read gonna it. absolutely fucking love it um, and I think that that would be true, even if you didn't hear me excitedly exclaim that every time that I bring its name up, but the key idea he does in that book and that book is, I think it's a masterpiece. I think it's a modern day attempt at the archetype of articulating the Tao that's close to the Tao Te Ching. I hmm. think it's that good. And the idea that he's playing with is there are finite games and there are infinite games finite games are played to be brought to an end when a finite game is brought to an end there is often a winner and the winner is often given a title and there's prestige and things like that and there's a loser and there's some type of like history of the wins and losses and infinite games are played so that play will continue Infinite games do do not have an end. They do not provide or produce winners and losers and titles, and they don't have a history because the game just continues to go. He goes through chapter after chapter of, of explaining like aspects of finite games and infinite games and basic, like, like almost everything that we do in our culture that involves us interacting with other people most of the time we are unconsciously playing finite games as finite players. A lot of us treat our relationships like we're actually finite players playing a finite game and that there's wins or losses and that if we break up, it's a loss or if you mm-hmm. cheat on me, it's a loss or whatever. And then I keep this history of all my relationships in the past. And it's like p- political elections, law oh, yeah. is a game. A trial is a finite thing that is seeking to produce a winner and a loser and there's a title and there's a history and there's all sorts of things. Almost everything that we're doing in our culture are different types of finite games. The thing that he hints at, he doesn't ever say directly because I think that that's just an insight into how wise and smart he was. Uh, He died recently. Is that at the very end of the book, I think it's the last sentence of the book. I'm, I'm not positive, but I'm pretty sure it's close to the end. The last thing he says is there is only one infinite game. Hmm. 
And what he's hinting at is that the infinite game is the infinite game of life. It's, mm-hmm. it's that there is and that whatever is seems to be playing with itself in a way yep. that continues the game. And that the infinite game is played by the infinite player. There are no two, there are not two infinite players. There's one infinite player playing the infinite game. That's from this model, that's as close as you can linguistically get to the thing. Almost everything else is explaining the difference between finite games and the difference between the set of finite games and the single infinite game. Yeah. Yeah. And I think that like, I, I, I love the idea of understating and yet still touching the profound. Oh yeah. Yeah. And I think, man, I'm on this, uh, another recent trip that I've been on in terms of not a psychedelic trip, but a trip of digesting and understanding uh, a suite of ideas is this book, The Romance of Reality by Bobby Azarian. And he is this, um, he's a neuroscientist who is very steeped in complexity thinking. And is that a technical term? Complexity thinking? Yeah, yeah. So basically it's my, so I don't know the exact definition, but the way that I would describe it is an acknowledgement that reality is continually complexifying itself and that in reality there's a bend toward informational coalescing and evolution like we're we're taught that you know we're taught that oh because of thermodynamics I right. think it's the second law of thermodynamics. Everything Interesting. is... Interesting. Yeah. It, entropy is a fundamental law, right? That everything's sl- like Whoa. slowly but surely scattering, degrading. And and that information seems to happen right. in the opposite. It's an- right. anti-entropic. Yet, yeah. Here we are, right? Uh. Here, here's, here's everything getting more complex. Here's informational density getting thicker and thicker. I can Here's feel that makes more, me emotional to connect yeah, to. Yeah, more and more humans. And wow. this does not square with reductionistic physics because there is no observable physical force wow. that coincides with, with this, right? So then we have to do things that I think are very silly, like use a multiverse explanation, right? Hmm. And say, oh, well, we just happen to be in the one of Im- immeasurable other universes that are failed where the laws of physics were just perfect. And, you know, like, so the, you, I'm sure you're familiar with the term fine tuning. Yeah. Like this is a, this is a concept that physicists talk about in terms of all of the fundamental physical laws of reality are just right. Just the perfect recipe to allow like, planetary systems to evolve and stars and orbits and like, you know, create various different um, chemical elements and blah, 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 all the building blocks you need for life. And then, oh, look, lo and behold, the building blocks for life wound up right here in now, a perfect place. The interesting and- thing to bring into that idea that I think will help people appreciate why it's has more gravity to it than it might feel because at first glance it's like that feels like it's just a fucking cop out but it's like the only version where experience would arise at all to even talk about probability would be the version in which all the precursor forces were perfect like the, the there couldn't be an experience of consciousness in any of the universes that didn't have the just right preamble. And so right. it's, it doesn't vibe with our, it's like, if you, if your brain could only oh, here, create here, here, a memory when you have an or, pro- huh? Well, I was just going to say though, here, here's a problem with, with that is you could say, 
the only way in which experience could arise is if there were a creator. And it's the same thing as saying you're so so the example I was about to give, I think you're using it. You're you're using a set of circumstances to explain how we got here. You know, that doesn't actually have scientific. And can I offer the example real quick? Yeah, of course. What I was about to share, but it was that if you had some type of brain damage, where the only type of experience that you could code to long-term memory was when you had an orgasm. Your story about reality is that it's an orgasm. Like that's the thing that I think is hard for us to appreciate is there are no other examples that we could possibly draw from other than the example that we're in. Right. And we have the tools to look back at the brain damage, you know, to try to overlap these two metaphors where it's like, we know based off of what we know about physics that we've tested in experiments hundreds of times that if this force was tweaked 1%, there would be no life. Right. Right. And there's just, you know, hundreds of examples of that. Yeah. So that's essentially the whole fine tuning issue slash for me, it's not an issue because I like, I like it. It, it makes it seem like there's some rhyme or reason to the universe. But but to fold this back into the larger conversation, I did have a reason for going here. Because when you said, you know, there's one infinite game and it seems like there's one player. So if we look at the most cutting edge emerging explanations for reality existing at all, I believe it does imply some kind of agency. I believe it does imply some kind of either mind or it implies some kind of underlying teleological structure. And you can make really sophisticated arguments. And this is kind of what Bobby Azarian does in this book, is he makes a really sophisticated argument that there is both teleology in the universe, that there is structure, that there is some innate bend toward existence, toward being an incubator for consciousness, toward complexifying itself, but it doesn't have to be conscious. It could just be some kind of laws that for some reason we don't understand yet are embedded into reality, but at the same time, it doesn't preclude the idea that there could be intelligence and that there could be consciousness. So I completely resonate with that. When we look at all of the because for the longest time right this was all dismissed as like anthropocentric thinking or a bias toward intelligence or toward beings because we are beings that that do have intelligence therefore we map our own experience of reality out onto the universe as if it must have some kind of agency and then this was you know slowly eroded by um, the scientific enlightenment. And we've had this sort of hangover, this like dogmatic hangover ever since then, where we've been struggling to try to merge science and spirituality and meaning and necessity together. And I think we're actually getting somewhere in this explanation now And where I think we're honestly going is that it is, you know, a lot of people will default to talking about simulations and they'll default to talking about things that are in the zeitgeist and in pop culture. But I think if you, again, like go past simulation, go past all of these ideas, you get to a game, you get to some kind. And when I say game, I mean a process in which an agent is trying to accomplish some end. And I be- and that's kind of what it's like. I could go on and on. And probably people should just go should just go listen to the podcast I did with that guy because um, I think we we explore it pretty thoroughly there. And I deeply resonate. Does, and yeah. to the game point, um, there was a mathematician I forget his name who created something literally called the game of life. And him and a group of mathematicians got together over the course of like eighteen months, and they really tried to hone down. Like, what is the simplest set of rules that we could create that would then spawn a set of outcomes that is fundamentally infinite 
So how could a finite set of rules produce the infinite? And they would, and they thought that that would be a good analogy to like whatever systems have to be embedded in organisms to produce. Um, I believe so. They created this thing called the Game of Life. That uh, there is incredible videos on YouTube about. All right, so it goes like this. There's a grid. Let's say it's ten of by course. ten, of course, and <laughs> that um. You get to place like you can flip a grid from empty to full. And, you know, so that's from like white to black. And uh, at the end of each turn, if a activated square has less than two other activated squares directly connected to it, it dies. Hmm. If it has at least two squares directly connected to it, it produces in one of the open squares a new activated square. Wow. And I think maybe there was one more rule, and that was it. And so you as the game player get to choose what the starting activated squares are, but then from that point on, you don't get to intervene, and you just let the turns go. And when it's played on a computer, it's, it's like a thing comes alive. And if you get it in the right configuration, there's there's videos on YouTube, man, that <laughs> I will the the first time I saw it, um, I just screamed. Like I excitedly screamed and was like, oh my God. And it was like I could see that I was seeing a thing that I couldn't articulate, that I could yeah, feel was yeah, deeply yeah. important to my life's work. Like that was the thing that I could feel that I could see when I when I experienced it. But the idea that is extrapolated from that is that, and it doesn't take away from the majesty for me at all, but that uh, if there's some type of absolute reality that is that a part of its fundamentalness is that it pops into existence these like spherical things with yeah. the forces of nature and this is kind of the core idea of string theory that most of those things that pop up don't have the right initial rule set to then grow but as soon as one does yeah it's from our perspective it's the birth of a universe yeah, it knows what to do. Like there's just something in it that knows what to do. And then what eventually arises in that in in that self-sustaining complexity, us eventually comes. Now, what right. the fuck that means? Like one of the things that I'm really trying to weave into like my game of life lectures that I'm that I'm going to start doing in like 6 weeks is like everything that I'm about to tell you is for sure a lie. My hope is that it's a useful lie because the map is not the territory. All language is map. No language can ever be the territory. And any motherfucker who's trying to talk to you about their map, and most people, especially if they're quote unquote academics, like the way they speak is as if their map is the territory. And I think the thing that's just useful for people to remember is like anything that is happening inside of a podcast mm -hmm. or inside of a lecture, we are, well, so this is not yeah. actually completely true. Most academic speeches and lectures and classes are, it's, it's the mapping of the experience like before you go on a mission. The thing that's interesting about podcasts is that like you and I could enter into a type of intimate convo where we're talking about something deep where one of us confesses a thing that we have shame about or we share some really core experience that to the listener that actually becomes the territory mm -hmm. but most mm -hmm. teachers don't actually bring their students into the territory like it would be like a sex education class that got everyone turned on like that's where you tell the information right, yeah. well enough yeah. where it actually brings them into the archetypical space um, so I just bring that up to say that we don't know 
And the really interesting thing is if you can get clear on the set of questions that you know no human will ever know and can't possibly know because of the nature of either how the question is asked or what we are, you can put that somewhere where it's like, if I want to play with an idea, I, I can play with an idea. Mm-hmm. But there's a whole set of games that you can play in the game of life where there is a correct way to play it. There are things that you can learn that it's as if they are absolute truth and that if you start to get them right, like the quality of your life improves. And so it's like one of the things that feels important for modern people to remember is how to, all the things that, and I think that the rise of science is one of the core reasons why we have this modern confusion, but there's a whole set of assertions about the nature of existence that no one can know. Yeah. The best you can do is talk to people who can give you maps so you can experience it. But what you experience there is beyond language. So you could say that that's the realm of the mythic or the religious. And then there's coordinating in space time. And it's like, you can get that right and wrong. You know, like if you're trying to put together a dresser with your partner and you start talking only in symbol, she's going to punch you in the fucking nose. It's not helping. It's not working. Right. Like that's my problem right there. There is a domain where the literal and using signs in the Jungian sign symbol dichotomy, Mm -hmm. there's a right way to do it. And right is just, there's an effective way to do it. There is a realm of reality that doesn't give a fuck about your feelings. And then there's a realm of reality that is completely made up of your subjective experience of archetypes. So it's all your feelings. And it's like, if we can get clear on like where that permeable boundary is, we can start to like work on the things that if they aren't in the right place, it actually causes us tremendous pain. You know, like if, if your physical body is ill, there are a set of things that you can do if you knew what to do that could completely transform the way the entire universe feels to the way that you create the story of it because your blood pressure is back under control. Like that's a real place that can be coordinated with doctors and you know with yourself and with what you eat. And then there's the realm of like arguing with someone about whether or not you're going to hell. You know, it's like if you want to play that game, that's a dope game. But do you know what type of game it is? And like, are you actually projecting your mom onto this person and trapped in the past about a thing that happened when you were 12 and that you're actually not listening to what the other person is saying? And both of you leave with more hate in your heart for the other person. Like, yeah. Is that the game you want to play? Yeah. So one of the things you said reminded me of one of the other places I wanted to go back to and it was the the free will question and how i think that like i i used to be not sure on what what i thought about this question because the argument that people like sam harris bring up is a very sophisticated argument that can be presented as if it's data like it can be presented to you as if look you're the sum of all of these pieces, your, your neurons, your genetics, et cetera, et cetera. You at no point get to control those things. And at every point, those things get to exert a degree of control over you to a point where we can look at your brain and we can know what you're going to do before you do it. Therefore, no free will. And how do you argue against that, right? Because if if they're saying, like, no, I know what you're going to do, I, you know, all of these things, you really don't have a vector through which to even attack that argument because the only vectors you have are subjective ones. Like you can you can say, I made a decision, I had a feeling, I did this, but there's no piece of data that you can use to confront the argument they're presenting you with. You can also say, Something happened there. That person changed at this point from whatever all of the previous evidence piled up and suggested they would do next. And it could be something very mundane. It could be like, 
that person didn't smoke a cigarette today after smoking every day. It could be, whoa, human beings uh, invented an engine. It could be, you know, like whatever. And if you if you zoom out, I think you can disprove the idea of a lack of free will or determinism because you can see evolution taking place and you can see these moments where an organism changes, where it develops a new um, physical capacity, where a person changes their life, whatever. But there, you can't pinpoint why or how. You can only see it in hindsight. Yeah. So there, so there remains this magic. There remains this invisible thing. And you and I don't have a problem with this because we say, "Oh, that's psyche." We say that's mind. We say that's will. We say that's spirit. We say that's soul. We say that's whatever. But to someone who exists in the empirical and the reductive, they they have to attack that with every fiber of their being because if they don't, then it relegates their entire discipline to something higher and that yeah. i think freaks them the fuck out and but to me it doesn't it, it makes me excited yeah and i don't think anyone will ever explain that away to me and we could say for the purposes of this conversation that's the player in action you know that's that. that is the the yeah. that's yeah 100 percent. the thing about sam harris's argument that's really interesting and you know, I've listened to him give his iteration of it like 10 plus times, but it wasn't mm -hmm. until mm -hmm. he was on Lex Friedman's podcast, I think like a year and a half ago, uh, where it actually clicked in me in a way because I didn't feel like I was trying to defend against it, which wasn't because like I was like, you don't know, but I'll hear you. And it just it landed in a way. And what I registered is he feels that almost everyone that's argued with him about this has completely missed the much more interesting thing that he is saying. And that what he is saying is that he experiences himself and his life without an I and with no will. And that as he's speaking to the other person, the question that they don't ask that's much more interesting is, wait, so are you saying that you don't experience a I and you don't experience the choice of will? And his answer to that is exactly. Thank you for finally recognizing the much more insane thing I'm saying, which is that- I don't believe that. And, and like, it's one of those things where we can't know someone else's subjective experience, but I've meditated deeply enough to, it's hard to articulate, but I've gotten to the place where I can register that I, at a certain zoomed inness, I have no choice over how my ears hear and yeah. that something in me produces thought and that something inside of me witnesses thought. Like, I cannot stop this unless, I'm assuming unless I kill myself, but I actually don't know that. Right. And there's a, there is a mystery at the core of experience itself that is so weird that I think, my personal thing is I think that Sam has had catastrophic hell experiences when he was younger with psychedelics and he's used the rest of his life to slowly and elegantly put his psyche back together mm. and that it's it's almost like he's relaxed into whatever his hell experience was which is that he doesn't have will but he can still live a good life and he can still like show up to his family and all that shit so the thing that I think is super interesting is the foundation of his assertion is primarily phenomenological. And then it's after that that he tries to build evidence on top of that. The thing that's so frustrating about that quote-unquote argument is 
it's like you sat down to play chess. Your opponent plays a move. And you just eat the whole board. Right. Because to, to make the assertion in the dynamic of a debate or like a hogos type thing, and then to speak the word technology of you and I both have no will over what we are about to say next. It ends the game. And I think it confuses people so much because yeah, like... And They've never kind of a, entered into a word game ever in their life where someone ended the game without physically attacking them or leaving. And so it's like Sam mm-hmm. Harris eats up the whole tennis court yeah, and then just looks at you. But in a way, he's he's kind of making a semantical move that I think is kind of almost like a, I see what you're doing, but so what? Because... If you're saying that you're not in control, you're not this person named Sam, you're not this, like, whatever, I can get behind that. (laughs) But at the end of the day, you're kind of just making a switch from first person to third person. Okay, I'm not this being, but guess what? Right now, this being's hungry, so I'm going to have this being eat. Right now, I'm not this being, but, you know, like, like... It's I get what he's saying in principle, and I know where he's we obviously know where he's pulling from because he's very steeped in Buddhism and Buddhist practices and meditation and disassociating from the ego and seeing the ego from a more outside perspective. But it also doesn't really change the fundamental nature of the human experience. Like you're getting a more zoomed out meta view where you you have a better view of the game and all the hierarchy nested games that are you there is but you're not but you're still not outside of it you can't ever be fully outside of it yeah and again the lex friedman podcast is where i got to see at least from my perspective what it felt like why he thinks this is a useful thing and the thing that he finds that's so useful when people relax into this fundamental truth is the way that he sees it it seems is once you really connect to that this core fascination that humans seem to have about lamenting that they should have done other than what they did in the past and that because they didn't that is a reflection of their worthiness as a person now Mm-hmm. And potentially their worthiness about the quality of the state of their soul for eternity after they die. And his thing is, it's like all of that evaporates when you start to connect to, again, what he thinks is the fundamental truth that you don't get to choose. You couldn't have done differently. And all the shame and the guilt and the pain. And the like self-flagellation and all that shit that comes from that um, will is something that can be evaporated. And that's something that I think he thinks makes it useful. But my I hope I get to have a conversation with him one day. Yeah, uh, same. Where it's not on camera, or at least I ask this part, because my core question is, how do you disagree with your wife and your children? Like I I know your free will argument well enough to know your answers to most of the things that I say, so that's not interesting. I also don't know if you'll be completely honest if we're on air and I ask you that question, but from one being to another, all right, if you don't believe in free will, um, how do you navigate having an argument with your wife or how do you navigate like if your child lied to you or if they stole or if they cheated on something, like, how do you do that? Because my intuition is that he and his closest relationships, either consciously or unconsciously, have to learn to let go of that story that they don't have will so that yeah. they can engage in the type of communication games that if they didn't engage in, their psyches would start to go crazy. Like if your partner is doing something that causes you pain, there is a part of you that like needs to believe that they have will and that if you interact with their will in such a way, they will change. And it seems to be so deeply embedded in our evolutionary 
physiology that you can't run some of those basic programs with the people closest to you if you don't yeah. play that filter over it. Yeah. And the last point on this is like, I really resonate with the pragmatic metaphysical view that I don't care what you say, what do you do? What mm -hmm. you do is what you actually believe. And so yeah. I'm curious what he believes when he's in intimate space with people he cares about where the underlying goal is to change behavior. Yeah. Yeah. And I, to me, I, I eventually just get frustrated with, with that conversation because to me, it does become a semantic conversation because everyone listening to this fucking conversation knows there is a vector by which you can alter your life for the better or you can make a mistake and your ability to iterate on decision making to get better at it makes a giant fucking difference. Like whether you're just like, I can't stop eating cheeseburgers blah, and you just eat cheeseburgers for the rest of your life or you suddenly do a David Goggins and you just like 180 <laughs> your life and you're like, no, fuck this. It, it's hard, but I'm going to do it. And you consistently do a hard choice that you know is good for you and it ends up paying dividends. You can pretend that that's not free will, but then it's a semantic conversation. It's that person utilized a capacity, whether, and, and this is how I've come to understand it over time, is that if you're playing Red Dead Redemption or you're playing Elden Ring, some game with a large open world capacity, you and I could sit here and debate about whether or not we have free will, right? Because that character can't fly out of the screen and just start sucking your dick, right? <laughs> like that, that's, not, that's not a possibility. It's yeah. not a possibility. But there's a whole bunch of shit you could or could not do within that world. And to me, that, that seems like it. that's what makes sense to me, is that our possibilities are hugely governed in this world and hugely influenced by everything like nature, nurture, et cetera, laws of physics, blah, 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 blah. But within that, within the playground, within the game, again, coming back to it, are there consequential choices you can make for you, your character, your development? Mm. To me, the answer is an absolute and resounding yes. And if your answer is a no, I think you're doing sophistry. And I think you're just like beating around the bush yeah. in a really... Yeah. So check out this like, inner model or this inner image that is arising is it's almost like imagine ancient Greece and there's all these different arenas that you can go play a game inside. Sam Harris is an absolute genius in the regard that there has been an arena that many people have gone to that uh, there's a long, rich history of that arena because they did a lot of writing, but it's, People go and play a type of game that is that can only be played in the arena. It's not a game that works outside of the arena. So it takes special type mm -hmm, of mm -hmm. environment to allow for that game to be played. Sam Harris has developed a play style that if you enter into that arena, you lose. But it's really interesting because it's the type of arena where like the people who really get it just go outside and camp and like live outside. And just like, mm -hmm. it's like a place that people go before they learn that the real game of life is out outside. And it's like yeah. Sam Harris on some level has like, it's almost like he's developed a machine that can out compete any human in that game. And it just sits in there. And it's almost like it's teaching people stop coming in here. Like, this whole idea of two people arguing about like unprovable aspects of reality that are instantly refuted by how you behave. It's almost like it's a machine that's trying to get everyone to go outside because the, the refutation to Sam's incredible articulation is how you live your life. Like, Mm -hmm. Maybe I'm deluded, but I deeply enjoy my life running the perspective that I have will. I love the fact that I run the 
perspective of life that I think he's playing a game. He knows he's playing a game and he doesn't run his life with that type of operating system. Um, or to the degree that I imagine that he is, um, it's actually not that far away from how I live mine. And we're just kind of arguing over the details, but that like you lose the game by saying yes to him, to even having an argument about whether or not someone has free will. Yeah. And what, another thing I've noticed too, is that the best games always have a way for you to stay in bounds in a way that makes logical sense, but it doesn't mean it's right. And an example I came across of this recently is I was talking to uh, Shane Moss, the comedian, who's, yeah. you know, he's like very into science, very into evolution. He knows a lot of like obscure scientific facts and terminology. And we were talking about evolution and there's a specific term for an adaptation that actually lowers the fitness of an organism. What's it called? So an ex I, that's what I can't remember. Mm. But but the concept is basically you see a peacock, right? That plumage actually does not make it more fit. It's a display. Uh, it's a mating display that like actually penalizes it in terms of fitness. But it's like but look at how much BDE I have with this like giant plumage. And you, you want, you know, you want this. Right, a and, and, and so that, so that's what I'm saying is like, yes, that that's an explanation. Right. And it, it makes logical sense, but is the beauty of a peacock actually only reductive to that function? And, and that's, that's what I'm saying is like within any of these games, because clearly evolution is a very good game that you can extract limitless amounts of knowledge out of. And you can, again, or what we're saying psychology does, where it wants to orbit around one central thing, right? Whether Whatever con that concept happens to be to that thinker, whether it's sex for Freud or transactional psychology to this other guy, whatever. It's kind of like evolution is almost one of the most meta games you can conceive mm. of because it has to do with the actual... Yeah. Survival and yeah, so propagation of a of a species, but is that the only reason? Like that that's the thing that I end up having trouble with. So, I just heard this idea like a week ago and I've been chewing on it since then and it's it's a big one. And it's the idea um again, it was on the Lex Friedman podcast. That's kind of the main one I've been fucking with lately because he has so many high caliber scientists on there. It's it's incredible. But um he had on one of the top chemists in the world. And one of the, the, I only listened to like the first half an hour and the chemist said some fucking incredible shit. But one of the things that he said was that um, like the fundamental, like there are the four fundamental horses that physics has articulated. Yeah. And then he thinks right below that tier of the four fundamentals is the next closest fundamental and he calls it selection and selection is a force in the universe that is prior to any biological life hmm. and that the selection um is a part of the thing that's happening about whether or not a electron is going to bond with some other yeah. particle to create a molecule and then it's the thing that will eventually give rise to a planet that can give rise to an atmosphere that gives rise to a body of water that then has the type of heat that could produce the type of random binding of something that will eventually get to the point where it, ha where it can replicate itself. And then you get the beginning of life. But the argument that he was making is there's this thing that we would call natural selection. He takes off that part and just calls it selection. And that force was quote unquote choosing, but we don't, it was selecting for something that eventually gave rise to life. And then it was long after that, that arose sexual selection, you know, cause right, the two right, right. primary forces in evolutionary psychology would be natural selection and then sexual selection. And they're meaningfully different. And the idea 
the idea in his perception of selection is what I see as the infinite player. Yeah. Yeah. And I think that's a great insight because it gets to this problem that we were alluding to before is that when you see so much complexity in the universe and the fact that the universe does exist and all this deeply, deeply informationally dense life forms exist, you can't get there through chance. You just can't. Like the the odds are truly ridiculous. So you have to then look to some sort of teleology. Just or to be selection clear, it's technically possible, but not likely. Yeah, it's ex- yeah. Like the the odds are like stupidly tiny, and you have to think to yourself like the odds are never ending. So the odds that anything from now on would continue to contribute toward further complexification and toward physics, you know, like all, (laughs) like, it's like all the time. It's like miracle, 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 miracle. But we're just so used to it that it's like, it's not miraculous anymore. And this is why I, I, I like this idea that, um, is presented in this book that I was talking about the romance of reality, because it's a more sophisticated way that's scientifically rigorous to talk about teleology and to talk about that there is some innate bend in the fabric of reality yeah. that is so he so he doesn't think it's consciousness and him and I we didn't spar on it but I I asked him to clarify many times like why is it not consciousness like why is consciousness not fundamental in what you're talking about and he as a neuroscientist is very particular about what he conceives as conceives of as consciousness right. because consciousness requires all of these brain activities and it requires structures that we know are doing certain activities that map the world map sense of self and where is that like where is it in this you know in a non-biological being like because yeah. because they know uh, within a brain roughly how these these mm-hmm. things happen and so I respect his expertise there, but then there's always the open door of like, we see behaviors, you know, just like in these natural structures and these like simulations you were talking about of this infinite game, like we see behavior that seems to be intelligent and you have to continuously be asked the question of like, what is responsible for this intelligence? And if yeah. it is just some teleological structure of reality what the fuck is that yeah. like where where did that come from because that again seems to indicate some a priori intelligence right that installed an algorithm or installed something and he actually is very warm to that idea he's very warm to some kind of like um like naturalistic deism i guess you could call it where there's like a set of rules somehow that was potentially put there by some kind of quote unquote agent. And we could say that's a simulation. Uh, We could say that's a programmer. We could say that's a God. Um, And apparently, according to him, even people like Dawkins are open to this idea. Like he said that like you can have quote unquote, an intelligent conversation about like a naturalistic deism or something like that, which I was very surprised to hear. So because it, I think yeah. fundamentally the the there's a lot of things I want to offer there because this is super interesting. Uh, but on the first point is I think the natural deism fits perfectly with string theory, and so they don't need a god at all. It's just with the right amount of math, this type of thing can arise. They have these rules, boom bang, and I think that that's the only way that I see that squaring with Richard Dawkins. But I don't know. The thing that's really interesting to me, and something that I've been One of the things that I've constantly not resonated with spiritual people who share that they know what happens after death and that they know that some type of coherent experience that feels close enough to like who they are continues on after they die. One of the reasons why that never vibed with me was because I have just a rudimentary introduction to the hundreds of years of scientific evidence that we have about when this part of the brain is damaged, either through accident or disease, it changes people in this way. And there are hundreds of stories, hundreds of studies 
yeah. that make it uh, uncomfortably clear that your body is producing so much of the contours of the felt sense of your experiencing self that we have no idea how much of it is actually the production of our body. And one of the things that blows my mind is how there are people who claim that they have had experiences without a body. It's your in, astral body, bro. In this it's lifetime. Your astral body. Come right. on. It's your astral body. I I'm saying that in sort of a joking way, but honestly, who knows? Right. We could but we could I just have want to offer bodies or something. Yeah. But when I drill down what they mean, and actually it depends on the person, but if I had a camera and I watched your body. When you had that experience, you know, because you like probably had that experience with either breath work or you did a bunch of mushrooms, your body is still here. Your heartbeat is still beating. Your brain is still doing a tremendous amount of things. And it is generating, or it at least is incredibly correlated with the felt sense of you having an, an experience where the part of your brain that seems to activate when people have a inner sense of their somatic body, that part is currently inactive. And then you have an experience where it feels as if your body is gone. You eventually come back into your body, you know, to use a weak phrase. And then you start to tell this story. And the thing that I think is most important is I wish people um, cared enough to be clear about there's the realm of things that happen in psyche. And mm -hmm. then there's the realm of things that happens in space time. Mm -hmm. And I would argue that a tremendous amount of those things do not overlap, but some of it overlap. And yeah. where it overlaps seems to be your body and your direct you dirty, experience. You dirty dualist. <laughs> you, no, but honestly, man, I, I find myself going there as well. And it's because... I don't know why it is, honestly. I, it, it may be some innate bias, but it may also be some innate knowledge. I mean, this is what Platonists would argue. To a Platonist, there is dualism. Like, there's spirit, and then there's matter. And this is the same with Gnostics. This is the same with Hermeticists. There's spirit, and then there's matter. We have both. That's what makes humans special. We have a spirit, and we have matter, and we have to, to a degree, work against the animalistic part of ourselves to align more with that mind, with that spirit, with that psyche. And that's not what I'm saying at all, just to be clear. I'm not yeah. saying that's what you're oh. saying. I'm not saying that's what you're saying. But, but I mean, yeah, there, well, there's different ways that you, you could be a dualist there. But so I guess, what are you saying? And to do, do you, are you inclined to, I know we, you and I don't usually say the word believe very often, right. but do you, do you suspect that you have something that could be called a soul? Yeah. So, what the core thing of what I'm trying to do right now with what it is I'm trying to do uh, with the part of me that used to want to, there's a part of me that has wanted to be the greatest philosopher of all time. And uh, it kind of put me into a psychotic state for like a year and a half when I was in college. And that part is still alive in me. I've redirected that drive towards how can I create some really cool, fun games for my kids that can help orient them towards life in a really interesting way that feels like it'll challenge me, use everything that I know, and will be fun. And so that's brought me to work on this game of life idea. And I'm actively, I'm starting from the place of my secret, my fundamental axiom is the thing that I claim to know or that I claim is true is that no one knows full stop, period, the end. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. But we all must tell story. And so what is the most interesting, fun, and a part of it being fun and interesting is that it, it seems to map onto this experience yeah. that we're having yeah. in a way where I get to do the things that I like, people are happy, I'm able to heal when I need to heal, et cetera. What is the game I want to give to my kids for how to interact with life? That's what I'm trying to figure out. Because of Donald Hoffman's work and all of my work I've done on Jungian psychology, it seems to be a useful lie to pretend that 
there is something that we vaguely refer to as space time that seems to be almost like a field. And I mean that both in like physics field, but also a game field where things unfold in a measurable way that can be expressed mathematically. And then we have our body and we don't know what the fuck a body is. We, it's, it is one of the most miraculous, incomprehensible things in observable existence. Definitely. And there seems to be something happening within the body that can change the experience of space time. And so because of what I know about both Jung and Hoffman, my conception is that I'm going to assume that there is a objective space time, not, no, that there's an objective reality that when psyche interacts with it, it produces the lens of space time. And so there is some absolute reality. There's whatever it is in me that generates a perception of anything. And then where those two things meet, we seem to have this thing that we call space time. We have developed the greatest coordination map for interacting in space time and it's science. It's the best. And that's one of the things I really want to make a strong argument for to the, to my people is it's like, y'all, when it comes to this part of the game of life, we have developed an incredible tool. Learn how to fucking use it before you just ignore it and get all lost in the weeds over here. Yeah. Yeah. But the thing that produces the experience of space time has the ability to get activated to the point where it eats your experience of space time completely. And that's like a psychotic experience or like, the psyche trumps space time, but there I seemed agree. to be something that when the psyche is in its default mode, space time is so fucking stable that we can make planes. And that the way that we seem to talk about psyche best is through metaphor and symbol. And it's almost like when we use metaphor or symbols and when we communicate with other people, it's like we're trying to help them find us in psyche. Like we're trying to coordinate on an archetype. And that's why we use symbol and metaphor. But when we're trying to do something in space time, literal and sign. So like a stop sign or like math is the ultimate expression of, you know, the energy of a sign is best for if you're trying to fucking build a house. Like, don't talk to me about metaphor. Now, the interesting thing is like, we can talk about metaphor to determine whether or not we want to build a house, where we want the house to be, what we want to feel in the house. But then when it comes to actually making the house, don't give me metaphor, let's use sign. And the example I give is in when it comes to the macro, we do this perfectly. Like if I go up to you and I say, it's cold as fuck. I'm not making any literal yeah. assertion about yeah. the temperature that my body gets when I have sex. And we just all know this. Right. But, and it's a larger conversation, but I think because of the rise of science and then the birth of the idea of evolution through Darwin. And then that triggered a mutation in Christianity. And it was the birth of fundamentalism for the first time. I think that whole thing created this rupture in our ability to sort in the macro archetypes with space time. And that, the moment fundamentalism was birthed into the world game of stories, like religion got handicapped hard because the fundamentalist, and I still haven't found a way to explain this clearly, but the fundamentalist makes a incredibly detrimental move by trying to play in the arena of science with science, but yeah, what they bring yeah. is a book of metaphors. Yes, totally. And 
So they cut off their people from the power of this book at navigating the psyche. But then they try to force them to convert the symbols into signs and then to compete with science in the arena of science. And like the only yeah. way to do that is to fucking start to, you have to start to gaslight yourself in a way that I think makes it more likely for mental illness to be birthed because there's a really great idea about what triggers schizophrenia or most mental illness. And it's called double binds. And a double bind is essentially when you're getting two sets of feedback from reality and that they completely contradict each other. And the easy example would be a mother who actually resents you, but says, I love you, but you feel from their body every time they say, I love you, that they hate you. Like mm. that will trigger schizophrenia eventually for most people. There's something happening in the current like worldview schizophrenia that we're in. And I don't want to use that word lightly and I'm, and maybe it's not the right word to use, but a mental confusion where we, almost all of us, not you and I, but most people, cause you and I are fucking weird have no appreciation for symbol or psyche yet it dominates your life. Like it doesn't give a fuck whether or not you honor it. I mean, it actually does, but it's not going away, but they only interpret life through sign and through literal signs that when an archetypical experience happens, like what does a culture do that doesn't even believe in psyche uh, they're going to give you pills because they believe that you are some type of machine that if they can put in the right things, the right outputs will come out. They don't know what to do with people who are having, you know, like what Carl Jung went through. Like if Carl Jung wasn't Carl Jung and he lived in the U.S. today and he had the symptoms he had when he was in his mid thirties where he had his deepest insights that then for the rest of his life became the groundwork for every major paper he wrote over any original idea he had. If he was in the U S and he was in that experience, that motherfucker would be put in a mental Institute. He would be given horizine and some type of anti psychotic and we would never have gotten young. And I think that One of the things that I ask people to do before a lecture or before like a workshop is I'll have them draw a tree. And 99% of people will draw a tree with, they draw a trunk and they draw branches and they draw leaves. And that's how I've drawn a tree almost my entire life. And um, I forgot who I was reading, but I was reading something that helped me realize that's an amputated tree. That's a fraction of the tree, but it is a, the perfect reflection of how we perceive reality. Mm. That a tree, like even if you're not trying to get fancy, it's at least all the roots, at the very yeah. least. But if you study an ecosystem more, I think you could make the argument that like, no, what actually makes that tree a tree is the trunk and the roots and the branches and the leaves, but also the fucking sun the atmosphere, the soil, the other organisms that break down the fallen limbs that then fertilize the soil, like the dead limbs of the tree fertilize its own soil. And it's like, we, I, my intuition is that the best set of metaphors for understanding the psyche is nature, that the most complex, like organic type of nature we have are ecosystems. I think whatever the patterns of ecosystems are, are the patterns to best understand how the psyche works and how like the internal family system slash archetypes slash dreams, how all those things weave together. And that like, it seems to be that the best type of player, like, you know, like when you start an RPG, there's like, different classes you can choose. I think, I don't know what the name for it is yet, but it's, it's some type of like engineering gardener where it's like, there's an aspect to gardening where you, 
where you don't know how it works. You just listen and provide the scaffolding where you can and life does what life does. But then there's a part of mind where it's like, when I'm in the game with other humans in space time, like I can actually make engineering like claims that are akin to laws of reality and to like learn how to do both, I think mm-hmm. will uh, help people be less mentally ill. Agreed. So, so I thought, I, I thought you might be going back, back around toward the end, but originally before that, I asked you if you believe or suspect that you have a thing called a soul. And I thought maybe the, you were alluding to something with the, the ecosystem and the root system and the psyche, but I wanted, I wanted to put you back on the spot with that question again. Yeah. My, my intuition is to say no, but then it's to like, I would really love to know based off of everything that you know about me, how would you define soul to really help me zoom in? Cause yeah. when I hear soul, I think of the kind of eye rolly Christian mm-hmm. idea that yeah. the totality of my personality, as I experience it now, somehow continues on after I die, even though I don't have a body, but I'm still going to feel male and like Eric and like a American who had the type of mommy. Right, right, right. Of course. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I think there's a lot of different ways to view it. I think it, it's sort of like how you talk about God, because God could be what we were talking about before, just like unitive light unitive mm-hmm. light we were talking about this before mm-hmm. we recorded i think so we should probably go back to that <laughs> but if you if you look back at the more mystical systems of spirituality it's almost always an irreducible quality of oneness and light so like kabbalists talk about god as something like the father of lights or something like that um obviously you know Hin- hindus talk about it in a similar way where there's like this uh brahman kind of soul animating quality to the cosmos and that's what a person's soul is is their atman is essentially like a little piece of that vital essence um obviously the way that i think you and i tend to think about it or maybe not to project onto you as i think about it more in the greek way in terms of psyche where we're talking about something that's both spiritual and psychological so that i think it's something I think there's something central to it that is having an experience. But I think the experience of Eric is likely very, very far from its essential experience. So like the essential experience of a soul, I don't think we can say Mm. what it would be because it's like a koan to try to like strip yourself of every faculty you have to make sense of reality right it's like what what experience would you be having if you had n- none of the five senses you know it's like i feel like koan, i have an answer yeah. right um but does that mean you're not having an experience like i don't mm. think so but i don't i don't think we can conceive of what it would be like and maybe the closest we could get is a completely ego obliterating psychedelic experience where we feel like we've remerged with some fundamental unity or something like that. hundred percent. And so yeah. um, if a soul is some continuous connection with the all, do I think I have that? Yes. Um, if the soul is any type of experiential form that in any way feels like Eric after I die, my deep intuition is no, and just like an LOL at the um, like, just I I have hesitancy saying childishness of it, but mm-hmm. there is that's how it lands in me. Uh, but I am completely open to being wrong to that. But the way it feels, um, and these experiences are so uncomfortable that like it's, it's hard for me to really get back into them because there is, there's a, uh, a annihilating nihilism 
that is also alive in the same time with the most awe-inspiring tremendum. But it's, I think the best way that I can describe it is it feels as if I am, like if you imagine hundreds of layers of like living tissue of like, you know, Mm -hmm, some type mm -hmm. of organism, and let's just say the epidermis has a hundred layers of living tissue with its own type of like blood source and cells and all that shit that like I'm in between like the experience of Eric in this life is in between one of these infinite amount of like layers and the, all the layers are alive and everything happening within the layers are alive. And that like, Mm -hmm. I'm like one cell in between two of these layers of some organism and that I seem to be able to have experiences where like the permeableness of the individual cell opens up enough where I start to be able to like feel the whole vein of the whole body. And then there's times where it feels like I can feel the whole body. Mm -hmm. And as a metaphor, the whole body is infinity. And infinity is the most disturbing concept that I can connect to. I've connected to it long enough to really be able to feel the like play and the love with it. But there is still this essential, like if you zoom in to the proper aperture, everything about your existence is completely meaningless. Like in, in the most absolute way. But then there's a zoomed in this where it's like, this is the best There is nothing more ecstatic than this direct experience. And you have people to play with. Like Mm -hmm. uh, one of the things I wrote the other day that really resonated with me is I was kind of just journaling to myself and I got to the point and I was like, I am because others are. Because I could feel Mm -hmm. that um, I had an undiagnosed schizoid episode in college for about two years. Really? Yeah. And um, I was at the point where if my, if I had lived with my parents and I wasn't as um, linguistically and argumentatively gifted as I am, I absolutely would have been put into a mental institute and I would have been given diagnoses and all sorts of shit. And fundamentally, the reason was I, I was afraid of intimacy. I felt shame about myself. I didn't think I could trust people. I didn't think I could get close to people. And so I dove deep into philosophy and psychology and nihilism and existentialism. And I used it as a fucking force field to not be close to people. And I almost like, I never wanted to, I never tried to kill myself, but I definitely got to the point where my inner story was like the type of inner story that I think produces cancer in someone when they're like hurty, like that's where I felt I had gotten. And the thing that saved my life was love. And it's, it's, uh, like platon, like the type of love where another person can feel what you're ashamed of and without having to say the words because you're too afraid to get there, convey to you that you're safe. And it was like, as soon as I had one close friend, that close friend introduced me to a couple of other close friends. And then I found my first partner and uh, her and I dated for like three years and that moved so much of my shit. And now I'm at the point where like, I can think about these ideas deeply enough to the point where they can really hurt. And then I can go play with people I love and just let it go. But mm-hmm. from a intellectual standpoint, for whatever reason, something that's haunted me my entire life is this idea of eternity. And um, to the degree that I feel I am a part of, or I am an emanation of eternity, Uh, if that means that I have a soul, yes. But the thing that you really helped me connect to is like maybe the experience of what it's like to be a soul is it's the infinite player that grokks the, yeah, the whole. And then a part of the grokking is it eventually plays down to the small. 
Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah, it's like, I mean, I think, you know, to to try to leverage an as above, so below kind of thought experiment, you know, I, clearly I have no idea if a plant is having any type of individual experience where it has an inner life, though plant consciousness is becoming increasingly interesting with some of the experimentation they're doing. Yeah. But it's so, so if we just use it as a thought experiment and we think, well, there's a unifying principle we call a tree, right? It may or may not be aware that it's a member of a larger community. And that larger community may be unaware that it's part of an, yet a larger ecosystem, et cetera, et cetera. And if consciousness and the phenomenon of beings reaches back up to some kind of unifying principle in the way of being a god, it isn't possible to be disconnected from that. You see what I'm saying? Like, it's not like you being like a, a, in space time, a piece of fruit whose time comes and it drops off the branch. Like, it doesn't nullify the larger logos logic that it's attached to 100%. like you're like and and that could be that's something that may just remain intact no matter what and it just has all kinds of different experiences and all kinds of different you know incarnations in a way that's probably not static that's probably the problem with this you know trees appear to be static and like they're not moving which of course they are moving 100%. and they are and i think know, that that's the great illusion or one of the great illusions that we're constantly trying to remember is not true because i think all of us know it as a truth on some deep level but we confuse it daily and it's this idea of the idea that there are separate things is fundamentally untrue and we know it but it's also incredibly useful to create uh elegant distinctions between certain types of phenomena, which, and that's literally what language is. It's what any thought is, any concept you have in order to even apprehend an idea or a concept, you must cut out the infinite that it is embedded within. And that one of the beautiful things about the finite and infinite game is the idea is that uh, everyone is the infinite player, but the infinite player will start to play in a finite game and then will forget that they forgot. And so it's like a tendril of the infinite player gets caught inside of a finite game um, because it forgot that it forgot that it's the infinite player. And the ultimate forgetting that you forgot is that you are somehow apart from the infinite and that you have a finite life. And then there's, there's millions of people who are playing a game where it's like, if I don't do the bad things that I actually want to do, or if I do the good things, or if I somehow achieve enough, or if I'm able to be courageous and beat whoever the just right bad guy is, I can somehow earn the right to not die. And it's all this yeah. stuff around like we're, we're trying to bargain with something unconsciously to get out of death, but it's because we think that death is the end, that it's a finite game. Like what's interesting is even the idea of um, heaven and hell imply that like you get one game and then the results of that game will produce for you a thing forever. And it's it's still being caught up in the illusion of a finite player playing mm -hmm. a finite game. And there's something like there is a part of me that feels that death is safe. And I don't understand. I don't know what the fuck that means. And there is another part of me that like there's a part of me that feels that death is safe. And the other part feels no one knows, no one has ever known, and no one ever will know what happens after they die. Most people are so afraid that they pretend like they know, even though deep down they know that they don't know. 
And there are people who have created entire religions trying to convince other people that not only do they know, but they can give you a game that you can play so it doesn't happen to you. And that all of humanity that has ever existed in the privacy of their own heart knows that they live their whole life not knowing what would happen when they died. And we're all gathered around the same fire of, I am terrified of death and I have no idea what happens when I die. Mm -hmm. And that all of humanity like is at home with each other around that fire. And the, like the sentence that came through was, uh, our home is the unknown. Like all humans are at home in the not knowing what happens after you die. But if you can feel into the fact that it feels like home to be in the unknown, the ultimate unknown is death. And it's kind of this, it was basically a poem that came to me when I did mushrooms last time. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, man. These are profound truths, Eric Godsey. Profound truths we've been talking about for three hours now. <laughs> two, two recorded, one non, unfortunately. Um, where did I just hear this, though? What you were just saying reminded me. It might have been Hollis, James Hollis. Um, it's good company. But I, um, but I think he um, he was quoting someone else. But the quote is like, um, "Life is the mystery between." Or like, oh, what is it, man? It's something having to do with like life is the mystery between birth and death, mm. where it's like kind of flipping it on its head. Yeah. You know, it's like, or, or it's something about like a, a fall from the, the womb to the grave or something. It's like the, the brief, the, the brief mysterious fall between the womb and the grave or something like that. But, yeah. but yeah, there, that's, I have that sense, man, that very similar to what it feels like when you, you get through the come up of a psychedelic experience and you go through all of this. Oh, fuck anxiety. Like I always have this anxiety, like, man, I did this again. What am I doing? Like, <laughs> but then you get, you get, you get to this place eventually of familiarity of like, oh yeah, why, why did I forget about this? And why did I make such a big deal out of all of that shit? And by all of that shit, I mean, daily life, like yeah. what I'm doing, what I'm worried about, if I did a good enough job, like there's always, when you reach that state of higher knowing, I always feel like I get this sense of like a pat on the head of like, it's fine. hundred percent. Like you're doing, you're doing fine. Don't fucking worry so much. And I, I, I suspect that death may be like that. Death may be another one of those moments of like, you did just fine. You did just fine. Yeah. Like one of the, I've been really inspired actually by Ido Portal and the way that he thinks about exercise and movement is he's not trying to get strong. He's, he's trying to collect movements. And I was like, I really like that idea. And so since I've heard that it's been about a month, I've been trying to cultivate like as a storyteller, I want to be able to hold the greatest amount of stories. Oh, I like that. And that one of the stories that I'm playing with is um, what if life is safe? What is if death is safe. One of the ideas I've been trying to hold that's a really uncomfortable idea for me is what if what you most desire was actually embedded in you by nature and that nature is God. And so God is inspire is conspiring with you to manifest what you most desire because that is what it wants from you in the same way that it would be like if, if a tree felt like it could yearn to be any type of tree, but it was an oak tree, but it just so happened that in the privacy of its own heart, what it truly yearned for more than anything else was to be an oak tree in this part of the world with this type of land. And everything is, is like, it feels like to the tree who feels like it can choose, like, wow, Everything is like helping me like move, like look at all these synchronicities. I'm, I, I have a branch mm -hmm. now. Blah, blah. 
playing with the idea of whatever is our highest desire is actually our destiny in the same way that the destiny of an oak seed or of, of an acorn is to become an oak tree. And what if everything is actually like, what if the living intelligence of life itself was working in just right alignment with me for me to manifest what I most desire? Because my default is that's never going to happen. Life is fundamentally tragic. We make up stories to cope with the absurd, existential, impossible situation that we're in. If I try really hard and I get lucky, I might get close to it. But along the way, a catastrophe can happen at any moment and kill the person I love most. You know, and it's like, that's an easier story for me to hold. And so I've, I've been playing with this idea of just being able to hold that other one and just trying to see stories as that, as like a story collector. Yeah. And it, and it provides a counterbalance too. Like if you know that you tend toward a little bit more of a like, nah, man, shit's just happening. <laughs> There's no rhyme or reason. It, I think it's really important to balance yourself out with like the total opposite. Like that's the, that's the, you know, even as a person, like you said before, that you believe that our natural state, if we're honest with ourselves is to be uncertain, right? And, and I'm, I'm with you. I mean, I think that that ambivalence, I get, I get closer and closer to, to certain alignments, but I, I fundamentally do maintain that ambivalence and that uncertainty for sure. But if you know that you are biased toward a certain way of seeing the world, I think to be a good, not only story writer of your own life, but to have a sophisticated psyche, you have to you have to sincerely play with the opposite. Like you 100%. have to sincerely grapple with the thing that makes you uncomfortable, or you are bypassing, or you are leaving shadow Tory shadow territory unexplored, etc. So I I like that man. I like you, <laughs> Eric. I we can keep you, going. Man. I don't care. I mean, if you if you got more, let it rip. And if you have let more, rip. um, the thing that I was about to ask is, uh. What do you feel like is an opposite that uh, you know in order to cultivate your psyche, you need to go explore? Because for I'm, me, just to like help anchor it, is like accepting the idea that like the universe is alive and, and conspiring in my favor with the totality of the influence that God has or whatever is helping me live my dream life. Like that is such a deeply, like it, it actually grates a lot of me. And like, you know, in the yeah. same way that like cheese can be grated by metal. It's funny how close that an actual grate is, which is an interesting thing, but that's very hard for me to hold. Um, what do you feel is like an opposite for you? That is a edge for you to feel into. Well, that so that that one actually does gross me out too because I just it seems too Pollyanna. It seems too idealistic. It flies in the face of too many bad things that happen, and you get in this place where, well, those person, those people just didn't know how to believe enough. Those people just didn't know how to like manifest it or, or whatever word you want to use. But really the one that's the hardest for me is just nihilism and chaos. Like the, mm. that, no, there really is no purpose. Like you really do live in the one universe that had just the right conditions to survive. You're not special. There's not like, there's nothing special about life. Your life doesn't matter. There's no point to it. Like everything's totally open-ended chaos on the verge of boiling over at all times. Like, I, I don't like that. I definitely don't want to live in that universe either. What's interesting so I, is my conception of the just rightness of the universe allowing this life to be, that to me does not equal nihilism. That to me actually equals, and then from that arose humans that have this whole game of life that is what it is. And it's like, the aperture of the human psyche is large enough to hold God within it. Like that is a koan I want to drop for people, but 
I think the biggest misunderstanding between my work and almost anyone who I talk to when we start to get down to some core experiences is that um, my conception of how big and intelligent the psyche is, I think is larger than pe- most people's idea of God. Right. And I would agree with you, but then I, I also think we're playing the semantics game of between psyche and God at that point, because you're talking about intelligence on the order of God level intelligence, and you're just using different words. Right. You know, you're no, just using... That's exactly what I'm saying, is that um, the map that I have in my head of what psyche is is a more powerful entity than most people's like fourth hand understanding of Yahweh. Like it's right. It's like what the greatest human hero who have ever lived, what its power was compared to all of the natural events that happen on the face of the planet. So hurricanes, earthquakes, tornadoes, volcanic eruptions. It's like the difference in magnitude of power. That's how I, yeah. Like, well, the, 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 this is this is the god of Plato and the god of Hermeticists in my understanding because what that's what they're talking about. They're talking about when they talk about nous, when they talk about mind, they're talking about mind. All of like all of mind, like the entire world and everything that can will ever happen is contained within that mind. And we are connected to that mind and doing whatever processes they did spiritually. We're all in an effort to reconnect with that mind as close as you can get to it. And I think for most of them, the idea that you could ever fully connect with it is out of reach. Like, cause when you, when you, when you said, when you said, uh, the human psyche is large enough to contain God within it. I actually wanted to say, I don't think it is because I think there's a limit. I think the well, aperture so that I was we playing have on, is is too limited yeah. to really I was go playing on all words the way there. there. And yeah, yeah. I think that what I meant by that is most people's conception of God is some type of agent that yeah. has a personality, that has some type of like it's it's a quote unquote player. I think why Darwin's introduction of evolution was so fucking disruptive is there's a bunch of reasons, but one of the major mythological reasons is that it changed many people's inner conception of the thing at the top from a player to a system. Yeah, right. And like those are two incredibly different things. And so anyone who has a conception of a God as a player, that thing is a anthropomorphization of your psyche is what I feel. Yeah. And that the big thing, the thing that cannot be named is more like a system. It's more like trying to understand a complex system than it is anything like a player who has a personality and, you know, and, yeah, you're yeah. yeah. Yeah, you're you're looking at like you're trying to explain every nail the demiurge has ever hammered into reality as if it's like as as if that's what caused reality to exist. It's like you're looking at the individual nails in um the system as a science. Well, I I'm I'm kind of okay. I'm I'm thinking two different things here. So I'm thinking from the perspective of if you're a scientist and you're looking at the sh- the physical structure of reality with all its bits, all its permutations, whatever, you're looking at how those things work and how they're interrelated. And that to you is a sufficient explanation of how the causation of reality. And you're not wrong. But also, people like you and I who are obsessed with psyche always go back to the point of 
but what but but what about mind because mind you're you're shining a light on all of this intelligence and you're not giving a requisite explanation for the existence of intelligence as it relates to this complexity at least that's how i think i always that's the way that i think i shouldn't say that's how you think because i think you're more open to the idea of a more like sy- systemic reality than i am maybe i don't yeah, know i'm definitely I, I, open I, I, I never know exactly how you think it yeah <laughs> so the, the thing that's interesting to me is i think most people who live who are alive right now have almost no idea or appreciation for the tremendous rigorousness for centuries that generation after generation of philosopher and then alchemist and then scientist who have mm-hmm. had direct contact with the great peer of the generation before them for hundreds of years where they've developed a system of trying to understand that is able to get through all of the gunk inside of us that that has us deceive ourselves and that that's produced a body of knowledge that is one of the most incredible pieces of art that humans have ever created that is such exquisite art that we can make planes from it, but we're also fucking stupid. So we turn bombs from it. Like our mapping of space time through mathematics generated the atom bomb. You could make the argument that no other piece of anything humans have ever done or is anything close to that thing. You know, that's an argument that you can make. And that, that is one of the most precious things that humanity has ever developed. And what I see is in most of the people that I'm around is it's like they critique the thing that they don't even like they've, they've totally never even walked into the thing. They have no appreciation for how much fucking work was put in for people Mm -hmm, to mm -hmm. see through how they deceive themselves. And they sit on the cities built by this thing. Like they're on their fucking phones and they're doing their fucking things. And they just say, they make assertions about the nature of reality on YouTube or Instagram or in their books or whatever, that if, if you are consenting to you're making a claim about, the, about something that happens in space time, you're unequivocally wrong. It's wrong. Like, right. And, if you, and the thing that I'm trying to, uh, the other thing I see is it's like almost no one appreciates the like unutterable majesty and mystery of what the body is and like what the totally. body's doing and totally, like what's happening inside how much of what you feel you are is the result of the body that you have and it's how like it's almost like yeah. both don't recognize the abundant insane awesomeness of these two like fundamental pieces of whatever the game of life is and that like it's so weird like it really feels like as a collective culture we're in kind of a psychotic state where almost all of us play the game of literal science yet we've ignored the best language ever developed for it which is math and logic yeah we're like ungrateful children basically and we've cut off the fucking we've cut off psyche like we live in a time where most people interchange myth for lie and it's like if you want to know if a culture is fucking sick they think myth equals lie. Right. And it's like, that's when you know a psyche is fucking amputated its connection to the symbolic life. But the really awesome thing is I also see that there is a renaissance happening. And one of the things that I feel very called to do is to try to offer some frames so that like 
the there's so many sweet people who are doing psychedelics and are in the spiritual space that like if they knew how to coordinate in life, they would fucking rejuvenate towns and cities and save farmland and just do great things because they truly have worked through a lot of their resentment and their anger and shit like that. Mm -hmm. But because they've just kind of abandoned the beauty of what science can give, they're incredibly ineffective at like coordinating in reality to produce change and blah, blah, blah. And then the people who are super good at coordinating in reality have so much resentment and anger and fear and are and are sick because they don't know how to eat and they have dysfunctional relationships with most of the people in their life because they were never shown an example of how to be authentic and they're working somewhere that they fucking hate and they actually don't believe that the average stranger is a good person or that humans are fundamentally redeemable and that there's actually too many people on the planet and that they shouldn't reproduce and it's like if those two parts of this of our culture could start to talk to each other and like the heart that's happening over here can get into the mind happening over here and the mind over here can get into the heart happening over here yeah um, yeah yeah because it feels like and i hope to god i'm wrong but it feels like we are on the trajectory of having some historical events happen in this country that will be marked in history books as like the beginning of the end of the United States as a governmental entity. I would love for that not to be the case. Uh, that is a part of what I feel is coming. And that, that happens if we can't talk to each other. And it feels like and this is a whole other thing that we don't need to get into, but like fundamentally, one of the things that I know I want to, bake into my game of life frame is for people to notice what happens when we begin to scapegoat and to never contribute to scapegoating a group. And that in order to not scapegoat a group, you're going to have to learn how to not exile your shame. And so like, just to go down this for a moment, as soon as you have a word that you can use for a type of person that excludes them from the tribe of your empathy, yeah. you then now have found a word that can eventually perpetrate evil. And I think it was Eisenstein that said it really eloquently. And he said, evil is the concept that births evil. And it's, it's the idea that you require a category of evil to then whip up a mob to do evil acts against a group. And so, you know, for Hitler, it was Jew. But for us now, we, we have a bunch of exile words. We just don't have a group that has got enough power to then act on their exile groupness to try to, you know, do mm -hmm. terrible fucking things. But to the degree that we use exile words against other people in our culture that we don't agree with, we are adding to this momentum that's happening in our country and in our culture, in Western culture right now, where we live in an environment where it's just going to take one well-organized demagogue to whip up a group with an outgroup enemy that will perpetrate violence at scale. Yeah. It's scary. And I would like for that not to be the case. And I think that there's something about the, it's really interesting, man. Like when people ask me what I'm doing and like what I do, the honest answer is, I don't know. Like, I don't know what the fuck I'm doing. Like when it comes to like, what am I working on? Like, I, I actually don't know. I just know that I show up to it every day, but it feels like there's two groups in our psyche right now that if we can get them to start to talk, it feels like it can be a large enough team where it can start to correct for some of these really radical parts. And I'd love to know what you think about this. I basically started to try to write an essay a month ago and then it's turned into the game of life whole thing. And it's just like, it's gotten really wild. But if you imagine there's the spiritual community, like, people who are really starting to connect to some of the repressed truths of how trauma work and how like attachment styles work and shit like that. 
And then there's the like classic successful people who are in the matrix, but they have found their way to be in the matrix in a well enough way where they do like, they genuinely try to help people and they do a good job, but they probably, you know, take these drugs to help deal with this thing. And they kind of have an estranged relationship with their wife, blah, blah, blah. And they're the ones who like make most of the things work. It feels like there's these two other really strong groups in, in our culture right now. And one is, you know, for lack of, I don't like these terms because they start to move into exile language, but just to help most people find the map, there's the far right and the extreme left. The interesting thing that I'm seeing is it's from a psychological standpoint, both of these groups are having a modern mythic confusion of the macro. What I mean by that is that the far right uh, group has like a collective, and I, I'm i going to probably trigger them, but I don't mean to, and I don't mean it in a derogatory way, but like a collective psychosis where they're taking an archetype and they're interacting with the archetype like a fundamentalist Christian would, and they're trying to convert the archetype to be literally real. And it gets to the point where they believe that almost anything that they see online is uh, a lie that it's being orchestrated by some group of whatever the most terrible outgroup is that they can imagine. And that this small group of people are purposefully orchestrating things in a certain way to produce hell. And that for, for, for at least a million people, they genuinely believe that it's lizards, you know, like that's just straight up happening in the world yeah. right now. Pedophile lizard aliens. Right. And then on the far left, there's this really interesting like collective psychosis type thing happening. That's the same thing where there is an archetype that they're treating like a fundamentalist Christian would treat Christianity, trying to claim that it's like science where on in, in one archetypical frame, um, quote unquote, patriarchy is real in one archetypical frame gender is completely a construct and that from a metaphorical archetypical standpoint, there is a way to look at the structure of reality where it's true. But then if you try to assert it as a scientific fact, as like a space time fact, that's where it's getting super fucking weird. It's like, no, there are two sexes that are defined by the type of sex cell they produce. They're different. And we could call one boo and one e or whatever, the, but there are two distinct types. They unfold through biology in a distinct way. Mm -hmm. And to say that that's not true is to do this almost type of schizophrenic self-scrambling in the same way where if you truly believe that there are interdimensional DMT lizard things that are harvesting fear on the planet, both of those things are taking archetypical. What does it mean if I believe both? <laughs> I'm, I'm, I'm joking, kind yeah. of. I'm joking, kind of. Did you finish where you're going with that? Uh, man, I don't know where the fuck I'm going, but it's. Yeah, I, I mean, I basically. No, I mean, it's, so the, it's, the core thing that I'm trying to work out is what's a fun way to produce games, like actual mm -hmm. games that people can play that will help them start to learn like what's the right type of language game for psyche and what's the right type of language game for space time and how can i get clear when someone i'm talking to is starting to confuse it themselves or when yeah. i'm starting to confuse it with myself and it's not to say that either is less true than the other like that's the wrong game i think if we can just learn how to start to see clearly, like, like the really cool thing about psyche is aspects of it seem to genuinely be outside of space time, like not metaphorically outside of space time, but actually, and I don't yet know how to articulate that well enough, but it really yeah, seems I don't like, know either. like the example that comes to mind is, um, 
if I've gone to war and I've incurred PTSD from a bomb explosion, and then it's four years later, and then I hear a firework go off, something in my psyche time travels and produces the, the exact same physiological experience I had four years ago. And there's something about how trauma works where it's like, it's the subjective content seems to time travel and then it's able to radically change what your body is producing. I'm going to, I'm going to throw something out at you. Yeah. What if, so clearly we know very little about the brain and how it works, especially you and me, but, <laughs> but, I, mean, but I mean, in general, like human beings and you and I have a like, like we're both real quick to be like, yeah, it's, it does seem like that shit's outside of space time because how can that exist in a physical place? But because we know so little about how the brain works and we know so little about the relationship between brain and consciousness, like how this goo thing makes consciousness, if it even does, which we don't know, but clearly it has a central role to play in the functioning in the body of the body our sense perceptions our hormones all of these things like clearly you just smush the brain like the being's not going to exist at least in this form so it almost seems to me like the brain is like a symbolic representation of some kind of higher structure And that like, because in the same way, like if you look at the universe, that it looks like this interconnected neuronal structure, just like the brain is, it almost seems as if whatever that geometric mesh is just extends and extends and extends and extends. And that consciousness itself, you know, like we always talk about the prop, like this Man, I, I feel like this conversation is just going so like no, I'm so totally tracking it. I'm like, and I have okay, some okay. In- interesting things to say. Um, so, in the same way that we cannot explain how the brain gives rise to consciousness in terms of like when does neuronal density suddenly rub the the lamp and the genie <laughs> pops out and oh, I have a sense of I'm Eric now. Like we, that doesn't seem to add up, right? But if it's something that exists and reflects back in on itself in like a universal way where it's just like this latent phenomenon of consciousness is just omnipresent and then it solidifies in individuals in a reflection of the macro in the form of a brain. Like the brain is like the inner cosmos that reflects the outer cosmos And that's how you get an individual universe is by creating this like this lower level reflection of a higher level phenomenon that exists everywhere. Like, yeah, that 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 seems like it could potentially be. So I guess I guess it is sort of like the the. The whatever they call the theory where it's it's a receiver or, you know, you're 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 getting the transmission of consciousness right. rather than producing consciousness. I get, I guess that was a really roundabout way of making that sound more interesting. No, but I think the core question that you were um, asking was why do, or do you think it's a reflection of our lack of understanding the complexity of the brain to believe that those experiences are outside of space time? And this is a really interesting thing to connect to, man, is that um, first, there's the hard question of consciousness, which yeah, the every, hard problem, yeah. yeah, the hard problem of consciousness, which every serious scientist and researcher will admit, we have no good theory to even offer that would produce an experiment to help us bridge the gap between why any of this thing, any of these things happening in the brain produce experience. And so I think that that's a good reason to 
play with the idea that maybe the contents of experience themselves are outside of space time and they correlate with something within space time. But now what's super interesting that I, I just played with this idea yesterday and it's that we do this really weird thing in science where we kind of ignore some of the miracles that we need to be brought in in order to even begin to play the game. Yeah. Specifically for all the behavioral sciences. And the argument that this scientist brought up was that the idea of energy in the body, yeah, of any energy in the body other than ATP, is bullshit. It is it is a modern Trojan horsing of us basically like offering. Um, I think it was called the Elan Vital, like the yeah Elan Vital, yeah. yeah, yeah. Just it just means like some kind of some animating um, vital, right? Yeah, vital quality. Energy has a technical definition that requires mass, and most of the ways that most behavioral sciences e- either imply or explicate energy in the body is is like if you press them on it. This is at least the argument he was saying. I don't, but he was a eminent researcher in his time. His name is Gregory Bateson. Um, he was like, that is a thing that's just been smuggled in that is not scientific. And right. that it really got me thinking about that we see that something is alive in the body. Like some, and we we still, other than ATP, the like movement and the things happening in the body, um, especially things that happen in the psyche, like psychic tension, like there is no physical thing there that has a mass where you could make the argument right. that it produces right. energy. And so whatever, like the thing that's fascinating, dude, is especially with psychedelic research. What they're finding is that you can ingest a psychedelic, have an inner experience where you like go into a forest and go down a waterfall into a cave and re- and rescue a younger version of yourself from a dungeon. And like that's actually close to an experience that a soldier had on MDMA psychotherapy um, that from that point on his entire life transformed. and. Right. And he gave credit that there was a moment that he knew when he opened that door that he was going to heal himself. Like I would make the, I would offer the frame that that happened outside of space time and that it directly affected, like it caused some change in quote unquote energy that we don't, we don't know that correlated with his physiology being fundamentally different for the rest of his life. Yeah, that's kind of what I was getting at when I was talking about your brain being like a simulacrum for something bigger. Because it's like we 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 run into this problem. This this is the problem with dualism. It's like how does the how does that outside of space time thing come into the reality of your subjective experience? And it seems like the brain is the most central thing to your own subjective experience. So wherever that came from it seems like it had to have a local reflection in the brain. And the brain is like this quantum box where who the fuck knows what's going on in there at any given time. Like you can look at it with an fMRI, but even that at this point is probably a pretty blunt instrument because I think it's really just showing like blood flow, if I'm not mistaken. Like, so yeah, you can look at electricity, you can look at blood flow, you can look at all these different things, but fundamentally we're just looking at like correlations that are insightful and and point us in a direction and are definitely important, but also to to try to boil that down into being the totality of like, oh, you just got to make blood flow <laughs> out of here and into there and make these parts of the Bruh. brain light up and not those parts. It's so much, obviously it's so much more complicated than that. And it seems like it's probably more like, I don't know. It's just, it's so hard to, to try to connect how you would get something subjectively transformative out of something like a light show 
in the brain. You know, it's just, it's just, it's, it's What's interesting obviously way beyond the purview of our ability to make sense of. Is like what you just said sparked the idea for me that it seems from where I can see that um, all of the development of more sophisticated AI is going to require the subjective experience of humans to give some type of feedback about their subjective experience to the correlation of whatever it is that's being observed in the brain. And well, what I mean by that is like if the deep mind AI, like deep learning algorithms started to be used in neuroscience to map like every micro change of electricity and yeah. chemical flow everywhere in the brain. I think they're trying to do that. They would get a really, a really high resolution map of all the things that happen in the brain. But it seems to be that in order to correlate that they will always need to listen to the subjective experience of the human. And it like, one of the things that I'm obsessed with is this felt sense of like, there are things so close to our eyes that we don't see that they're yeah. there. But if we saw that they were there, it changes everything for the rest of our lives. And that like, I think one of the things that we're so close to that we miss is this fundamental distinction between my phenomenological experience and it's why we had to make up that weird fucking name it's to like wake people up to the fact that really what we're saying is experience mm -hmm. but people are so close to it that they don't like there is something absolutely mysterious that no one who has ever lived has ever been able to articulate in a way that transmits to being able to create it that there is this thing happening that you don't have control over that like is producing your like VR experience of your life. And it's been doing that your entire life and it does it relentlessly. Like your heart won't stop beating. And there is something out there that if you don't learn how to coordinate with it, you experience tremendous pain and die young. And that there's this constant tension between this thing inside of you, I just knocked the fuck out of my microphone because I it wasn't, wasn't even that loud. Cool. It wasn't even that loud, honestly. And yeah, it feels like the thing that I'm really passionate about is uh, how trying to understand the game of life well enough to imbue rules into a game that a child will enjoy yeah. is uh, proving to, I'm basically like, oh, this project I started, I'm probably going to work on for the rest of my life. Well, I mean, here's the cool thing is I think if you lead with wonder and other intrinsic motivation, meaning you prioritize feeling over whatever's happening in the external world, whatever you're doing in the external world becomes totally secondary and I think that in and of itself is a huge sea change because- that, But I, if, I think there's a worthy caveat there real quick is it requires a certain amount of tuning your desires with reality where you can even begin to worry about that, where, where life works if you lead with what you feel first and then let reality come after that. Because like if you're young and manic, like that type of shit could get you killed. But like you and I are in a place where we've developed enough. Yeah. 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 I, I don't mean I don't mean chase like hedonistic intuitions. I'm I mean sincerely pay attention to what you're curious about. Sincerely pay attention to the things that draw your attention in and don't convince yourself that it's not practical. It's a fantasy. Mm. It's not going to work for me because, well, most people who go do this thing, they end up failing or whatever it is. Like if yeah. you truly feel drawn to something, you I think it's your duty to explore that thing, because if like what's the alternative realistically? Oh, it's not practical. So I'm going to chase the thing that has like a higher salary. It's like, well, 
we all know where that ends, right? Like we all got to make ends meet. We all got to be practical, but it's not like you're going to find yourself in a deep soul searching hole within a few years maximum. So it's like, that's how I've always looked at it. Like, obviously, you know, I quit my job recently and I've always looked at it like this is a means to an end. I don't know exactly what the end is, but it's not this job. Yeah. And I I better fucking orient myself so that I at least have an idea where I'm going afterward. And that's like what this whole thing, this whole enterprise of third eye drops and related things is like a poor in progress execution of. <laughs> it's like, how do I just go toward the stuff that makes me feel alive and interested? Because without that, I don't really care. Like what, like life is boring. Yeah. Life is not Life doesn't have that Elan Vital that makes me like, oh, what the fuck's going on with this? What's going on 100%. with that? Like, that's what I'm talking about. <laughs> is like, is 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 if you can focus on getting people in touch with that. Like another thing that we're obsessed with, the Daimon, the the that like inner whisper, whatever you want to call it. I think then the game matters way less be- or that or rather that becomes the game exactly that's the game not the yeah. not whatever you're doing in the particular yeah it's the yeah. yeah the thing so i this game of life and really one of my core challenges is going to be true to the spirit of it being like a 101 course in college like w- yeah what i'm talking with you about is hopefully if i can control myself will not be the way that i will uh, but we'll see. But the 202 course that I have churning in my mind, I'm calling Dharma weaving. But it's basically what I've been trying to do since I was 18, which is um, I'm nihilistic enough that if I don't find something that truly turns me on, I'll kill myself. It's, you know, like it wasn't that conscious, but that's basically where I was at. It's funny that I accidentally just did that. I don't know if you caught that. That's really funny to me. But, um, and I remember one of the things itself for people not yeah, looking at the video that I like contemplated early in college was like, what do I want to try to be the best in the world at that AI won't eat by the end of my life? Like that was actually because I was aware of what like Ray Kurzweil was talking about and all that shit. And what I chose was like the last thing that AI is going to get to is going to be like the psyche. And so I chose to go into psychology. And after I graduated, I had a job at Chipotle and I was there for a couple of weeks. And like neither of my parents had graduated high school, neither of them had gone to college and they were just happy that I had gone to college. And I had no one in my life that, did anything after college. Like I just, I had no idea. And I could feel like if I don't fix this, like, again, this wasn't conscious, but it's like, I don't have a strong enough ethic for life because I don't have a God that like, I'll just fucking die. And so, um, I felt like that too, man. I've definitely felt like I've had those thoughts of like, if this is what life is, I don't want it. Right. I don't like, this is not do it for me. And so the first thing I did is uh, first I found podcasts and that started to expose me to like the only type of men I knew that existed in the world before podcasts were either teachers, farmers, or people in uh, the army. And like, I, I didn't, I had to read the four hour work week four times to, to understand what an entrepreneur was like wait, I can make a company. I can, it, it's so, it's embarrassing, but it's also really funny to think back. Like the first time I read that book, I had no, I, I just did not understand what the fuck he said. And, but once I got the idea of entrepreneur, um, I was like, all right, what's the one thing that I want to study at? Cause I had learned how to study in college that like would be useful and that I could help people with and people would pay me to do. And so I bought like the top 15 books ever written on habit change. And I just obsessively studied that the unconscious byproduct of having studied that is I started to like change habits in my life and to land the plane is I consciously engaged in 
structuring my life with the demands of culture in a way where like the inner kid in me gets to stay excited. Yeah. And that the thing that I have found is that it right there. The happiest, not the happiest because where I'm at now is the most enjoyable my life has ever been. But the, before this, the most enjoyable period of my life was after I had gotten clear on what I wanted to like hone my mastery in for the next 20 years. And I was basically writing and teaching about science and philosophy. Uh, I got fired from the call insurance job I had because I basically just, I did the bare minimum. My team had the highest stats, but I lied about doing shit that was pointless and they caught me and they fired me and I felt lots of shame. But for like a year and two months, I had no job. And I just, I worked at a desk that I put in my dining room for like eight to 10 hours a day. Um, And I just studied and wrote. And I ate, uh, I would drink like a bulletproof coffee in the morning. I wouldn't eat lunch and I eat fucking vegetables and chicken at dinner. And once a week I would have Chipotle and it would be like the best possible thing. But the thing that I'm trying to get at is there seems to be something built into our body that when we start to develop competence at a craft that we genuinely enjoy, that reward cycle to me is so, is so delicious that I have to consciously watch when I start to become manic because it's so fucking delicious. Yeah. And like a big part of my life is like, you know, I have review days every couple of days where I kind of look back at how I lived the last few days, especially in the last month, I've been really deep in this thing. And I for sure have gotten back up to that borderline of mania. And it's like, all right, uh, what are my core duties to my body to take care of my body? What are my core duties to my friendships and family so that I feel like I'm showing up to them? What are my core responsibilities for the job that I have? And I'm always trying to, basically what I'm trying to offer is, is that the most self, like the thing that refutes nihilism the most, I think is developing competence towards the craft that you love most. Hmm. And that we live in a culture that is not completely corrupted to the point where if you develop competence continuously, like you're seeking the ever expanding horizon of mastery in the craft that you love, the world cannot help but respond to it. Yeah. And I've always had this intrinsic, like I've been broke most of my life, um, but I'm not anymore. And I'm really grateful for that. But I always had this intuitive sense of like, I don't do it for the reward. Like I obsessed over the Bhagavad Gita when I was in this stage of my life, but I knew that the fruits of the reward would eventually get to the point where like, I'm going to be okay. And it feels like you're in that place where you're going to start to get to fucking do that thing. And I see it's, it's been the best response to the part of me that's like, it's all bullshit, baby. And it's like, I can only tell that story when I'm not in the loop of developing or when I'm playing with someone I love, you know? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Well, thanks for sharing. I don't know. I I knew your background, but I didn't know certain pieces of that. So thanks for sharing that brother. And thanks for one of the most epic (laughs) wide ranging four hours, dude, wonder dips that we've, that I've ever had. Like I, I'm starting to, I'm starting to feel that feeling of like, am I out of dopamine? Like, what did I do? <laughs> like, I, I just like, like it's, I, I've, I, it's, it's been a lot of fun though, man. It's been a fabulous one. Um, I'm not looking forward to editing it. Not that I, <laughs> not that I do much editing, but I do at least go, go listen back and and make sure there's no weird shit. That's but, gotta be so great for your brain though. Like you're getting to review all these awesome conversations you have. Yeah, do, I mean it is it is wild. I I think that I've absolutely gotten more than a second degree in yep. so many different things through this show. It's it's fucking mind blowing. Like that, what you were saying something before 
about developing fluency in a craft. And, you know, like it was when you were talking about reading the four hour work week and you were talking about like, I just couldn't understand it. It's like, it's because we, it's like, everything's a fluency. Mm -hmm. And it's like the, the more of this kind of stuff you do, the more fluencies you start to build a little bit. And you're like, I know how to play in that one. I know how to play in this one. And you sort, it takes time. So you don't realize you're building it, but then you look back on, you're like, holy shit. Yeah. Like I can actually talk about this stuff with people who like went to school for it for some reason, not on the level they, they know, but at least a level where I don't sound like an idiot. And that in and of itself, it like, I think that broad, I've always been like, I want to know the broad strokes type of person. And it's not the most practical, but dude, I think it really helps you sense make in a very effective way. And I think that's why we have such good conversations is because we have all these like wide ranging influences. And it's like, you can say two, like if we didn't have to talk for the sake of the audience, you could say like two words to me and I'd be like, yep. And then, and whereas it would take like five minutes of context for everybody else. Right. Um, But yeah, man, love talking to you. Love you. So happy everything's going well for you. Likewise. Um, and congratulations for being in. I, we were talking about this before we started the podcast, but most people don't get a point in their adult life where they feel like they have an empty canvas in front of them and they have paint and they know how to paint. They don't know what they're going to paint. But I think it's a really special and, you know, privileged place to be in. And I I truly am excited for you and look forward to see what you paint. Thanks, brother.